Hi, and welcome again to another episode of the Shop Notes Podcast. Today is episode number 61. On today's episode, we're going to be talking about when to break the rules and frankly, what those rules are. We're also going to look at what it means to do spring woodworking and the migration of workshops. This episode is brought to you by Shaper Tools, the makers of Shaper Origin, the handheld CNC router that brings digital precision to the craft of woodworking. Tackle joinery, cabinetry, hardware installation, and more with speed and precision. Try it risk-free in your shop for 30 days. Visit shapertools.com to learn more. The last few, I don't know, days, maybe a week solid, we've had mm -hmm. decent weather here in Iowa, yep. which usually means that winter is looking to give you one more kick in the shins at some point. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, however, it does have me spending a little bit more time out in my garage workshop, which is always a good thing. And it also means that I can, I've noticed more geese flying over. Some migratory birds are back, heard red winged blackbirds on a bike ride this past weekend. And speaking of migration, it allows me to move things from my basement workroom, which is sort of attached to the laundry room where I can do some stuff in winter, back out to my workshop where it frankly belongs. So I bring, my glue back outside and some clamps, all the stuff mm -hmm. that I normally have to like carry back and forth. It's now time for the spring migration back out to my home out in the shop. So I don't know you, Logan, you don't deal with that because you have, yeah. you set this one out, Logan. Yeah. You got your got bunker it. shop there. <laughs> yeah. No, I've had some of the same coming out of, winter shop hibernation and going through the piles of stuff that need to get back to work on in there. So it's been nice. Yeah. But like you said, it might be temporary. Might get <laughs> snow in May yet. And yeah. You know, my so. wife actually said, she said something like if we didn't get snowfall after this date, it would like be a record for Iowa. Like, I guess we always get hit with a, a, you know, March or April snow <laughs> usually mm -hmm. at least one. Yeah. So, Feels I'm like Phil for this since yeah. he uh, he brought it up. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks. <laughs> well, I mean, there's the there's the whole Iowa mythology of girls basketball tournament having some sort of mm -hmm. you know snow event going with it, but mm -hmm. I think we missed it this year. Yeah, that was last week. So yeah. I think we're doing good so far. Right. Yeah. So now that the make a mess. Now that the weather is warming up, are you itching to fire up the the mill? Yeah, absolutely. It's actually, I just I realized I went out and I think I might have said this. I went out and cut some oak a couple of months or a month back, maybe um, in the middle of the snow, and I used my last two good blades. So I actually just yesterday ordered another box because yeah, it's. It's like, all right, got some logs that are now not buried in snow anymore. So they're back. So it's yeah. like, all right, we got some stuff here at mill. It's, I know my, the tree guys that I work with usually are going to start getting busy. So let's get it going. Mm -hmm. I got some so, fun attachments do, to put on. Do you have to saw or can you saw frozen lumber? Yeah, you can. Yeah, it's, okay. it's harder. Um, yeah. So the water in the woods frozen. So you have to use a, a blade that's meant for harder woods. Cause technically the wood is a little harder at that point. Sure. So, uh, but yeah, it cuts just fine. The, the biggest thing is the two biggest things is make sure you don't hurt yourself by slipping and something slipping because everything's wet and snowy yeah. and frozen. Uh, and you do have to change your lubrication depending on what you use. Um, so oh, okay. my blade lubricant, the blade lubrication that I use usually is just uh, water with Don dish soap. And that's obviously going to freeze if, if sure. I left that in. So my mill right now is currently, it's currently stocked with eight gallons of negative 30 windshield wiper fluid from Menards. <laughs> so mm -hmm. that was, <laughs> it's purple. <laughs> so it, uh, 
it is frost free uh but i will probably before i get the mill out it's in the garage right now but before i get it out and mill i'll probably throw some dish soap in there to help get a little extra slipperiness on the blade so lubricity yep so yeah i'm gonna switch I'm over to just the rain x one now exactly yeah now it's the it's the plus 32 yeah so but now right. I, I got some got some add-ons for it that i'm gonna do a video on installing and the sawmill's gonna get a little bit easier this year okay so, so like what kind more. of add-ons do you have like a um, lower handle so the kids can push it or yes yes child labor um I, i'm gonna have to pull a doyle then and get a couple more kids so they can take rotations <laughs> yep uh no i have some hydraulics here so i have an auxiliary hydraulic hydraulic motor well i mean it's just a motor with a hydraulic pump on it uh and hydraulic log loaders hydraulic log clamps and the one that I'm really excited about is the hydraulic log turner. So it will actually oh. has like a, a big, I don't know, probably 24, 30 inch chainsaw bar basically that lifts up and has a dull chain on it and it rotates through. So it rolls the log. So hmm. I'm pretty, I'm pretty excited. I'm still waiting on a couple of boxes. Some of the, uh, Norwood's having some, um, COVID related delays. So, uh, I'm waiting on a couple boxes still, but once they're all here, it's going to be a couple days of doing some video, putting some hydraulics on. Oh, I'm so excited. It's going to be a blast. <laughs> it's going to be so amazing just to stand at stand at one end and use joysticks to move everything. So mm -hmm. when I told my wife that I was going to lose weight by sawmilling, not going to happen this anymore. Summer. Last not, not summer, summer was the one yeah. that you did it. Yeah. <laughs> that was the yeah. summer. Okay. All right, so our main topic today is one that you suggested, Logan, on breaking the rules. Yes, mm -hmm. and I thought about this because of something I'm working on right now, and it's just a, it's just a small little minor project for the kids. Um, we are, what, last second week of March, something like that? Uh, so April is coming up, Easter is coming up, uh, and I thought it would be fun to make some little Easter eggs for my kids out of some basswood, right? Um, I had a basswood log that we cut on video a couple of months back. Uh, it's not dry. It's it's still pretty damp. Um, it's dry-ish, but it's it's perfect. So I'm like, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn some Easter eggs, either let them color them on the lathe, or you know just uh, cut them loose and bring them upstairs and let them color them at the table. Uh, but what I discovered on turning these, it's a great, fun little project because you can whip them out. Like, I just timed myself before we turn this podcast on. It takes me four minutes to turn one of these. Like, I just use about a batch of them super quick, right? Sure. So, in, I mean, in most things, wood turning, and this is a completely general blanket statement, uh, not true in all aspects. We're looking for symmetry, okay? And in particular, like, if we're doing beads and coves, um, we, you make a bead and you make a cove in two halves. And you're looking for uh, each half to be symmetrical, so your bead or your cove or whatever shape you're trying to make is symmetrical, just looks better. When you're doing something like an egg, it's not symmetrical. And it's very hard to, you know, over the last two years or so, I've been trying to train myself to get that symmetry down. You know, my whole goal is to make stuff symmetrical and make it look clean. Uh, when you're trying to do something like an egg uh, where you have a rather short round bead on the bottom and then you have a long long bead on top it's it's actually very it's i don't want to say it's hard to do especially when you're turning basswood i mean i might as well put a stick of butter in there and turn it um <laughs> but it's 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 very weird because you're breaking a rule but in this instance it's okay to break that rule you know some symmetry when you're turning an egg is out the window. Um, right. So I guess, is there other times in, in woodworking, uh, that you would purposefully break a quote rule? Um, it could be a, a unwritten rule or whatever. Um, or when would you? Hmm. Uh, 
Don't answer all at once, guys. Yeah. I'm I'm just waiting to learn the rules first and then <laughs> I mean, one that I thought about the other day and actually if uh it I was in my kitchen and uh Phil a couple Christmas back you'd given everybody a uh, a uh, coffee scoop, right? Uh, a spoon right. that you had made. And I was looking at that the other day and I think a good instance of that is cutting against the grain. Right. Like there's sometimes where you just can't help it. Oh yeah. So and, uh, whether like in the in the sense of spoons or bowls, I've found that uh, cutting against the grain will help you get rid of material quickly. It's just that you have to be well. Carving in general, I've found has made me keenly aware of grain direction and. Mm-hmm the some of the properties of different types of wood um, but going against the grain will allow you to split out material really quickly it's just that sure. you have to be aware of where that bottom of that split needs to be and where you want your finished surface to be so you can use it to quickly chop out material if you're aware of the grain and so yeah you can definitely go across the grain or against the grain or a lot of times like especially when i'm making spoon bowls the inside you know it's a lot easier to cut across the grain of the bowl than to try and you know work down into that Mm -hmm. hollow because you the wood is a lot easier to cut with less resistance i should say and then you can use that that cross grain bottoming cut, so to speak, as a stopping point. Because one of the things that I found that's really hard is when you're, you know, because you, you want to, for your finished cuts to get the smooth surface, you want to have, be cutting with the grain. Well, when you start going down into a valley, at some point you get to the bottom of that valley. And now if you try to come up in that same direction, you're lifting against the grain and you're going to cause tear out. So it's tough to be able to finish those cuts down into the valley without like undercutting one side. So then you come from the other way. Now you undercut the other side. Pretty soon you have one of those spoons that has a hole in the middle of it that isn't as easy to scoop out cereal, you know. It's called a funnel in wood turning mm-hmm. strainer. Right. Yeah. So you, by going across the grain you get that bottom cut and now you have a place kind of a landing zone for your other cuts to to finish out at sure so -hmm. So, and then you know another one is routing right Mm -hmm. we the proper i'm doing a lot of this in air quotes the proper way to route is against the rotation of the bit that's the safe the cleanest the best way to route are there instances where you will back route something yes. on purpose or not, John? Oh, on purpose, but it's okay. like, don't show this on camera. <laughs> so give me an no. example of when one of the, when one of those instances are, um, I, I guess when you're like, you're making a profile on an edge that you are, um, inherently going against the grain. It's like, you can't flip. The piece it's it's if you route it correctly it's going to go against the grain and um usually if you're doing you know a larger profile you're going you might take several passes at it and if you do the first pass and you get a chip out or um there's times when you're cutting a rabbit and you you can start it to hear it grab and and start to chip out and it's like mm, might have to back this off a little bit and and uh back route it in the other direction just even even if it's just for a little bit to get past that where it's snagging on the grain mm-hmm. you know so you just you gotta uh pay attention to not take off too much where it's going to grab the whole piece and shoot it across the shop yeah so. and i guess that's probably the biggest issue with backgrounding right is you're you're then you're feeding your work in the direction of the bit travel so the router wants to pull the work piece the way you're pushing it, which is, it's harder. It's hard to control. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that's definitely one. I, I also find myself 
if I'm pattern routing or template routing, uh, a lot of the times when you get to that end, depending on what the shape is, if you get to the end of the pattern in that last couple inches, if the grain isn't running correctly or if the grain is not in an ideal orientation, it can grab that last little chunk and tear it off. Yeah. Um, so I have I will occasionally come in and just very, very carefully, you know, clenching the cheeks, go back and back route it just a little <laughs> bit. Yeah. Um, and it just gives you that cleaner, the cleaner cut uh, yeah. just for that yeah. little bit. Yeah, sometimes too, like with temp- template rounding and arch, if you're going down and back up, you're coming back up and lifting that grain. So you might have to, you know, do a, a fine back routing pass on that side yeah. of the arch. So yeah, and when I'm doing arches like that, like you're talking like a, a toe kick or something on mm-hmm. a on a dresser or whatever on a case, I, I always like to use. Um, one of the double bearing bits or as bearing on top and bottom. Mm-hmm. So then it's like you just flip the flip entire it. thing over, raise the bit and then go mm-hmm. the opposite way. Um, but I have definitely done that as well. Yep. But I know there's one that I have demonstrated and shown people at uh, some classes that I've taught on the router table. Cause the, you know, the general rule of thumb at the router table is when you're facing the router table, the workpiece moves from right to left across. Mm-hmm. And that's again, to get the piece moving opposite the direction of rotation. Um, but I've found that you can use a router table and go left to right on it, depending on where the bit work piece and fence are in relation to each other because i did mm-hmm. a did an article on i called it ripping at the router table some people would call it jointing where you would take because uh, take a piece and then have the piece run between the bit and the fence because normally the the bit is between the work piece and the fence uh, but if you set it up so that you have the fence and your router bit um, the distance of the piece that you want to create you can take a skim pass and not only create a nice straight edge but that it's parallel to a reference edge kind of like a rip cut and in that instance in order to keep the work piece moving against the rotation of the bit you move it from left to right so sure uh, and that's kind of a fun technique to do. Uh, in a similar way, you can also do that to create uh, tenons on the router table by standing a workpiece on end, and again, having it pass between the bit and the fence going from left to right. And in that orientation, you get a much more efficient cutting action by the router bit, and you get a really smooth, straight, uh, tenon that you probably can't get the same way by making multiple passes, you know, if it's laying flat over a router table, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So moving to the table saw, I think most of us would agree that there are safe cuts at the table saw, there are unsafe cuts at the table saw. So I think that's pretty clear, clear cut. Pun intended. You guys see what I did there? Yeah, I, like I saw that. Uh, <laughs> um, but would you say somebody is wrong, or is it wrong, to rip a board with a crosscut blade? It's not right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do it all the time. I'm lazy. I hate. I hate changing blades and stuff. So. I do it. It's just not as efficient. Yeah. So okay. I wouldn't do yeah, a lot a of it. Put it. But yeah, I don't think that it's wrong. It just, like John says, it's not. It'll cut. Yeah. It's just it going to go it. really slow. Yeah. You might get a <laughs> really significant nasty. amount of burning. But <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. What about so, ripping with a dado blade? Oh, we've tra- we're going to have to video that at some point. <laughs> Or not? You're just That's, taking a skin speaking cut. of yeah, not not as efficient. 
<laughs> it's it's a wide curve blade. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's for when your saw is overpowered. <laughs> yeah. You need to. Yeah. You need to. Want to dial it back a just bit. a little bit. Yeah. Right. So, are you? Do you guys fall under the the philosophy that you should have two blades? You should have a rip blade. You should have a cross cut blade. Or do you say screw it? Throw all caution to the wind and you go a combo blade, and that's it. Hmm. See, you can go combo blade, but I still like having a rip blade to do like a, uh, you know, that has a flat tooth on it yeah. to do right. joinery and stuff. I yeah. use, I use my rip blade more for joinery than actual ripping. And then I'll use an all purpose blade for most ripping and cross cutting. And then yeah. a cross cut blade if I need really nice cross cuts. So yeah. That, when I had a good. table saw, I had, Outside of a dado blade, I had two blades. I had a, a combination blade that was kind of my everything blade. And then I had a, a thin kerf glue line rip blade okay. just to make. And I would switch that out in order to be able to make efficient rip cuts, you know, especially at the beginning of a project when you're breaking down bigger boards into smaller work pieces. You know, then it makes sense because then you do actually, that's where you can really save time by cutting more efficiently with a dedicated ripping blade. You know, but just for like a onesie twosie rip cut in the middle of a project, it's more hassle in my opinion to switch back and forth, which is why I had the combination blade. You know, it'll, sure. it'll rip, but it won't do it ideally. But the combination blade I had was nice for plywood and things like that. Mm. And, and it cross cut well enough for me. Yeah. And I guess that's where I am too. I have a woodworker too, thin curve. I, I have thin curve for my first table saw I ever bought. I probably don't need it with my saw stop, but I have a thin curve combo blade that works well for 95% of what I do. And then I do have a, I have a glue line rip. I don't have a super aggressive, like, you know, 20 tooth ripping blade, um, which I don't know that I ever really need, um, but uh, I think those two blades cover most of what I do. Uh, and I ask that because I know uh, our buddy Matt Cremona up in Minneapolis, he he is very adamant that you only cross cut with a cross cut blade and you only rip with a rip blade. So huh. I know he likes to switch out blades a lot. Yeah. I don't like to. So. And you can so, get it so that, you know, with practice, you can switch blades and it doesn't take that long yeah. to do. But um, I feel like there's a lot of other tasks in woodworking where you're switching back and forth between drill bits or router bits or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. And if I can if I can save a couple of pit stops, then that's Let's a little it. bit worth right. it for me, mm -hmm. especially so, when the difference in quality or efficiency may not be that big a deal. Yeah. So I hate to be jumping tool to tool, but that's what I'm doing. Drill press. Do you guys just speed for your bit size? <laughs> no. I got I'm one no, I head. got one yes. No. So I'm going to say Phil's the um, boss, so he's right. Yeah. John Oh, my wrong. goodness. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't – yeah, I'm trying to think that it's like I don't um, make that big of difference in drill bit sizes typically that I wouldn't need to change the speed. I guess, but sure. I mean, I guess, I don't know. so I guess theoretically there is a proper speed for each diameter bit, right? The bigger the bit, the slower it travels or the slower you should dial your mm -hmm. drill press. Uh, right. I'm, yeah. I'm under a, put it in third gear and leave it in third gear type of guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's slow enough for the big bits and it's fast enough for the small bits. <laughs> yeah. For, I guess for instance, I was, uh, drilling a two and a quarter inch i'm looking over at the drill press now it's like a two and a quarter inch, quarter inch forstner bit and um i started up and i was like whoa that's going really fast and then i just drilled the hole and and moved on with my life in record time <laughs> yeah it's like whoa that's taking off a lot but it was so See, you do adjust your speed right i do uh okay. i look at it in two ways well i i I both adjust speed and I actually use the depth stop most of the time. Okay. Which, I mean, those are part of the reason that you have a drill press to begin mm -hmm. with. Uh, the other thing I look at is 
you know, my ancestors crossed the prairie in covered wagons. Like it's not that hard to change right. speed on a drill press, all things considered. Right. So, okay. uh, so I look at it that way. Like I shouldn't be scared of work. Yeah. Uh, my drill press at home is an old Delta. And by old, it's probably my age okay. that has just the pulleys and you have to mm -hmm. yank the belt up and down to, to change speed. Um, the ones that we have at work are super nice because you can change them on the fly and there's a digital readout. So, you know, what speed you're at. And I don't, I'm not really shooting for specific numbers. It's more like a range. Mm -hmm. And what, what led me to this realization was I was doing an article uh, years ago for shop notes on Brad point bits, I think. And you know, cause we always talk about, you know, for woodworking, get Brad point bits, whether you buy a set or buy them as you need them, whatever, sure. uh, because they'll give you cleaner holes and stuff like that. And I had gotten some Brad point bits and I wasn't getting clean holes. And I realized that I didn't spend money on, you know, the super ultra diamond, you know, ambassador club level yep. Brad point bits, but I felt like they should have been cutting smoother than what they were. So I was doing some research for this article and found out that Brad point bits were originally meant for production cabinet work, woodworking. And as such, they were used in machines that were spinning around 3000 RPMs, which is moving. Mm -hmm. That's kind of like is the top speed of a of a typical drill press. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought, well, hey, I'm going to try it, not at 3000, but I set one of our drill presses at work, one of that old general that we have to do with the belts. I dialed it up to like 1500 or 1900 RPM or whatever. And holy crap, you know, like this bit actually exactly. made yeah. super smooth entry holes. Uh, there was, I felt like the tolerance of the hole was a little bit better. Uh, just all around was a much better drilling experience. So did a little bit more research on drill bits and found out that in general, I can boost the speed of drilling operations on different bits much faster than I had been or had been led to believe and taught. You know, because a lot of times, you know, I mean, we even did it on the show early on where we talked about, you know, you put a Forstner bit in to drill out the waste in a mortise. You know, you want to make sure that you have it slow. Well, I mean, that's good advice if you're going, if you're thinking like, don't have it at 3000 RPM. Good idea. Slow but, is relative, yeah. So slow is relative. But on a Forstner bit, until you get probably above an inch or an inch and a quarter, you can have that baby running at about a thousand, twelve hundred mm -hmm. RPM, and that Forstner bit is going to make a much better hole than if you have it dialed down in the like nine hundred, five hundred range is where we normally talked about having it. So yeah. that was kind of a revelation to me. I mean, now when you're drilling metal, something like that, then you dial it way back. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. in general, well, you know, like if I'm doing countersinks or you know pre-drilling for screws or something like that dial it up speed that baby yeah. up and you're going to get it there much better yeah and i think that um what a lot of people don't realize with bits in general and and i didn't i didn't really get this either until um i started using a brace and bits that a portion of a brad point and a forster bit is to sever the fibers before it pulls the chip out Right. So I think you can, on some bits, you can run them slower, but your feed rate has to go way down because you right. have to give those tips time to score the wood before the lifters come in and remove the chip. So, you know, by, by speeding it up, you're allowing it to do that process a little bit faster and you can feed it a little bit quicker as well. So. Yeah. And you don't, the bit doesn't grab either, you know, no. like when you're running it at a slower speed, sometimes that first initial plunge into the wood, that bit 
you can feel it jerk the workpiece. But when it's at when it's moving at speed, you know, you can just ease that right into there and you get the workpiece doesn't shift around or isn't as likely to shift around, even if you're using a fence. And you get a cleaner sure. cleaner result from it. Sure. So moving on our list of tools that you can break rules with. I know I've seen Phil do this. I know I've done it. Um, is somebody wrong for pulling a Western style plane? Hmm. Because, and I am only asking this because I know somebody will, I know people get their panties all in a bunch about it. Like, nope, there's a right way to use a plane. It's like, well, not really. Does it give you the results you want? Because then that's the right way to use it, in my opinion. But, you, uh, you, the, when you put a hand plane in front of somebody the first time, or when I do, I have a very specific set of instructions on where to put pressure as you are pushing that plane. Right. You know, you start pressure on the toe. As you start your cut, you move it to the heel, and you're basically trying to scoop out the middle, basically. Um, when you're pulling a plane, you can't really... The, the pressures change a little bit. And they weren't necessarily designed to be pulled, but they work well doing that. They can work well doing that. So is it incorrect to do it? Is it breaking a rule? Uh, I would say that it's breaking an implied rule. Okay. Because you see handles on on a tool like that or mm -hmm. in general on a piece of equipment, and there's an implication that the correct way to use it is that a hand goes on each of those handles. And I would say that even if you're pushing a plane, depending on the operation, you may or may not have both hands on the handles or the, yep. you know, on the tote and the knob or, you know, the, yeah, the tote and the knob, there would be, op, you know, times where you would want to grip the plane in a different way, depending on the result. Sure. You know, I find that when I'm jointing, I often will, I'll be driving the plane with the tote, but on the, on the front, I'm pressing down with my thumb, like just in front of where the mm -hmm. mouth is and using my fingers kind of as a fence. And then that gives me some visual and physical cues to whether I'm keeping the plane square. And I can also create subtle pressure depending on where my thumb is to be able yeah. to, to square up an edge. Um, sure. I feel like I also get a little bit better control that way. I feel like I'm less likely to tip the plane inadvertently one way or the other. Same thing with yeah. smoothing where I'll sometimes, you know, you just have your hand covering the knob or just in front of it or just behind it as you're pushing, as you're creating a surface too. Sure. So not necessarily in the same hand tool realm, but uh, you know, as you're saying that, made me think of it made me think of something Chris Fitch was doing, which maybe I shouldn't say, but I'm going to say it anyways. Uh, a, a handheld router. I don't remember what Chris was doing, but I walked by his bench one day and he had a handheld router held in a vice upside down using mm -hmm. it like a router table. Is that yeah. wrong, John? Do you think that's wrong with Chris being uh, your supervisor? <laughs> I'm not saying it's wrong. Videos. I'm trying to, because I saw that too. I'm trying to think of what he was doing. I think it was a very, uh, he had small work pieces and it was like a very fine cut on whatever he was yeah. doing. So it was like a mini little router table like yeah. for him. So I don't know. Uh, I don't know if I would do that, but if Chris could do it. If Chris then, does it, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. No. I've seen it in several instances, and I've actually done it a couple of times where you pinch the motor in your bench vise to hold it in place. That's my big thing is whether that's going to tip in use. Mm -hmm. You know, if you know that you have flat spots on your router motor that you can get a decent grab on it without it rotating. Um, but, yeah, I've done it where I've been – doing just a very light chamfer on something, especially on like a medium size, you know, smaller piece, you know, where you don't have to worry about trying to keep it 
super mm -hmm. flat and level on there. I've even used clamped on like a little fence to help guide a piece across, you know, just on, sure. it almost looks like your edge guide then on a router yeah. um, to do it that way. Is it something that I recommend for beginners? No. Is it necessarily wrong? Not really. It's just more of, have you taken the steps necessary to keep that router from shifting in use while the bit is spinning? Sure. So can I start referring to it in the magazine as a bench held router? Instead there you of go. Handheld mm -hmm. router? Yeah. Handheld router. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. So, I mean, I guess on the router thing, I think, John, I think he was working on those wooden ruler accessories. I think that's what it was. Oh, yeah. You Could know be. what I mean? Yeah. I think that's what he was working on. But anyways, uh, on the same router note, and I, this is a comment that somebody made on, it was a video that I was doing. I don't remember which video it was. There's been so many of them. But I was routing something, and it was with the Colt. So the little guy, right? Right. And somebody commented on the video on how they didn't think how I was using the router was safe because I was using it with one hand. Um, or I had my hand, like, I think I was holding it with one hand, but I wasn't holding it around the body. I was holding it down the base plate because I was able to rest oh, my yeah. palm on the workpiece surface. Sure. So is using a router without your hands, let, let's say a palm router or a standard handheld router two, with two handles, do you guys consider that unsafe to not hold it by the handles or to hold a palm router with one hand? I think the palm router with one hand is fine. It doesn't seem very torquey. Um, sure. The bigger ones, uh, I've probably used them with one hand before, but sometimes, you know, they'll, when you start them up, they want to like kind of twist or whatever. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I don't know. I guess it's just kind of how you, what you're doing and how it feels. But I don't know. The, the Definitely with the palm routers, one hand is totally fine. Right. And I'm, and I can, yeah, I, was, I can remember what you were doing too, and I can kind of picture it. You were kind of holding it by the base. Yeah, I don't remember what it was. Yeah, because you were holding and, it by that kind of like, like by the base and just yeah. I don't yeah, but and that's kind of how I like to hold it. Like I I like holding that little Colt like I do my router plane. You know, it's kind of hold it just like that, mm -hmm. and you're I don't know. It just it, it feels comfortable. It feels like I have really good control doing that. So you know, is it right? Or is it wrong? I don't know. Um, I know. A manufacturer would say, "Yeah, that's wrong because they don't want to be liable for me, you know, <laughs> turning my fingers into hamburger." So, right, right. But that's how I, you know, I did that art uh, article. We showed it on a TV show episode of carving with a router, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I did that same motion where I had a, a core box bit in the router, and it was one of those little Colts, you know, and the bit is only exposed eighth inch, maybe three sixteenths. Mm -hmm. And then I was holding it by the base plate, essentially, and I was, you know, tipping it in and out of the cut. Yep. Um, and again, it was more about maximizing control. There was just no yeah. way for me to be able to make that work as well as I could, holding it, quote unquote, correctly. Again, by the implied um, location of handles. Yeah. And I mean, it's like, it's like holding a pencil, right? Like you don't write like this because your writing's gonna suck. You hold it down at the the bottom where you're gonna have the most control. Yeah. So, you know, just one of those things. So. Yeah. So in... I think we're gonna take a break here real quick, oh. and give us a sponsor message here. This episode of the Shop Notes podcast brought to you by Shaper Tools, the maker of the Shaper Origin. That's a handheld CNC that brings digital precision to woodworking. You can use it to tackle joinery, cabinetry, hardware installation, and more, all with speed and precision. You can try one in your own shop for 30 days risk-free. Just visit shapertools.com to learn more. Okay, so the last, the last one I had. Now, everything we talked about has really been tool-driven, and I think I think... As long as you end up with, in my opinion, as long as you end up with the results you want and you do it safely, there's no right or wrong way, right? It's kind of what I'm getting at. Sure. But from a design standpoint, are there rules? And this is where it, this is where I think 
you get some designers that are really, really interesting and really good because they break the quote design rules, you know, Mm -hmm. um, are there certain design rules that you guys would adhere to or not adhere to, um, you know, mixing woods or proportions or anything. Is there stuff like that that you guys think, you know, no, that you need to do this or it looks wrong or you know what, this doesn't really matter. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. There's a lot of stuff that I think like either looks right or looks wrong to me, but it's, I mean, it's kind of an art. It's artistic. It's kind of what you like. And I, I guess nobody can tell you that it's wrong if, if that's what you want. So, I don't yeah. Know. But yeah, there's a lot of rules out there, but I don't know. Go nuts. Do what you like. That's what I say. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there's a lot of designers present company excluded that will say that you know before you get started on a project that you draw out everything you know you've filled x number of pages in a book of sketches and thumbnails and views of this that and the other thing you know then you do like a a full size drawing, like everything gets a full size drawing. And then you do a mock up with MDF and two by fours and, you know, put it in the place where it's supposed to live and all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, you know, number one, I don't have a lot of money to do woodworking to begin with. So I'm not going to blow it on two by fours and MDF. At least not right now. Yeah. At least not right now. Yeah. (laughs) And, I don't have a lot of time to do woodworking, so I don't, you know, I'll start sketching a couple of things probably, you know, because the, the idea for something will come across, whether it's a photo I see online or in a book or magazine or something like that. Mm-hmm. And then I'll probably sketch a couple of changes to it because it needs to suit my situation. But I just, I'm not a, drafter drawer you know i'll like i say i'll sketch stuff out and i want to get an order of operations or try and figure out trouble points and that's part of what i do when i'm writing projects for articles is try and figure out where those sticking points of a project are to point them out but i just can't can't do that mm-hmm. yeah. especially the mock-up parts yeah you know, and I, it's funny because I think I, I've the design aspect of woodworking really interests me uh, and what makes stuff look good. And I think there are certain shapes that are, I don't want to say they're set in stone because there's instances where people have used shapes that have not, should not work where they work, but they work. Um, but in general, there's some certain rules, like the rule of thirds. Um, You know, stuff generally looks better if it's in multiples of a third. So, you know, if we're looking at something like, you know, just from a turning standpoint, because this is what I have close to me, you know, you're looking at a hollow form. The top curve should be about a third of the overall height. The bottom curve should be about two thirds, roughly. That's what looks best in general. Um, Same thing with an OG. Uh, if If you look at an OG profile, an OG profile is 50% uh, concave, 50% convex, and they're, they're inverses. So if you grab two of the same router bit, that's an OG, flip it over, they'll meet up together perfectly. They're symmetrical. Um, but with that being said, I think there's sometimes that those are, those, those rules are broken, and they're not, I don't want to say they're really rules because I don't think they are, but um, there's instances where stepping outside of that looks really good. Uh, and I think that's kind of some of the, the interest to me, at least from a design standpoint is what can you really get away with? Like what can you make work that every design rule says shouldn't work, but it does. Right. Um, so, and I think that's where a lot of that interest lies for me. Um, I generally try to follow the rule of a third. Um, if I'm working on something, I had a little, what is it? The Fibonacci gauge type thing. Oh yeah. Um, 
somewhere. Uh, I don't know where it's at, uh, but I had it somewhere uh, for doing, you know, design work and stuff. Um, but it's same thing using like a uh, uh, French curve, like a French curve. Those shapes look appealing to most people. So, you know, there's stuff like that that I think is like, yeah, you should probably at least use that as a starting point. You know, it's a proven shape or it's a proven rule that works well. Use that as a starting point, but then feel free to go nuts. Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So what about you, rules, John? Because you've done some, you know, like when you've done projects for the magazine, are there any principles that you adhere to that you use as a starting point? Or are you... I don't are know. you just freestyling? Yeah, it's it's the ingrained woodsmith way that's <laughs> been beaten into me over the decade and a half that I've been here. No, I don't know. Uh, I can't. Yeah, I can't say that there's any like necessary principles that we we follow. But I mean, usually it's come up with a design or general idea and then everybody kind of has gotten a say on it but we've kind of gotten away from design meetings in the last year so you know things change a little bit but i don't know so all right how about, that's fair yeah. <laughs> yeah you know what i think it's interesting when you talk about styles of furniture too like um shaker design right shakers pretty low-key very clean lines very Mm -hmm. minimalist but then you see somebody make a shaker or something or other shaker sideboard or whatever and they use just this crazy figured whatever wood that's like super shimmery and there are people whose heads absolutely (laughs) explode like that is not a shaker like you cannot <laughs> right. do that. You cannot use curly maple because the shakers would have never done that. It's like, who cares? Like, I'm not a shaker. I'm not yeah. a shaker. <laughs> it's, uh, it's like, man, yeah. lay off. Yeah. I always think that it's kind of funny when, yeah, because you get the same thing if you've uh, built something inspired by a design school or even an individual that they mm-hmm. will, you know, just get roasted for, you know, not being true to that designer or whatever. We did a, a cabinet on stand a number of years ago that was inspired by James Krenoff. I don't know that you can't build, I don't know that you can build a cabinet on stand and not at least acknowledge that James Krenoff was alive and mm-hmm. dabbled in that form extensively. But we did it that way and had mentioned in copy. I don't think we even put it on the cover or anything, just that it was kind of inspired by James Krenoff. Well, we had a couple of his students email us just aghast (laughs) that we would dare tag his name on our project. And we had Mm -hmm. no concept of who he was and what he stood for. And this cabinet clearly explains or, you know, demonstrates that or whatever. And it's just like. It's like you were inspired by it. You're not making a replica uh, of one right. of this stuff. It's like yeah. I saw his thing and then I went, you know, the way I went with it. Yeah. So, you know, it's not, know. Well, you know, he didn't like invent you. the form, you know. No. No, we we did a, um, a linen press that was inspired by uh, the Birdcliff linen press that is in, mm-hmm. I believe it's the Metropolitan Museum of Art, right? Uh, yeah. And, you know, we, we made some changes to it size wise and stuff. And there's a couple of people that have built reproductions of the original one. And they're questioning like all these reasons why we changed stuff or, or why we copied their work and stuff. It's like, yo, this was a copy of, this was inspired by the original one that's in the Metropolitan where you inspired yours for, where you got the inspiration for yours. And we changed it because we thought it might be cool to make it a little bit smaller size for you know somebody's house or an apartment or whatever you know it's like yeah it, whenever whenever somebody takes offense i i don't even think taking offense is the right word but 
when somebody questions the design of somebody, when quite clearly it's been inspired by something like i i don't think you can come into the woodworking world and design something that hasn't been built before right there's yeah. always you were always building off each other's ideas in the woodworking world uh so i don't think somebody can lay claim to a certain style that is strictly theirs i don't think that i don't think that really exists um so you know it's it's one of those things that if it's right it's wrong it's it's your own design you know yeah. you start with something Start with something tried and true, or don't, and then make it yours. Yeah. I also think it's fair to, like, evaluate your own work, because there's some stuff that I've oh, done yeah. where that in the, after it's finished, you know, I got done with it, and it's like, you know, I, you know, I would have done this differently, but I feel like each of the pieces that I make is a lesson and a step along my progress. And that the next piece that I make will be better, you know, that I'll have learned from it. Yeah. You know, it's like kids doing drawing and art, you know, like when they're little, they're, you know, people are just one big blobby circle with a smiley face and arms and legs sticking off of it. And only mm -hmm. later do they figure out that there's bodies and how to start to draw that. It's like, you don't smash a kid down saying like, nope, they kind of got that face all wrong. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, cool, put it up on the fridge. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Yeah, my my kindergartner just got bonus points in her uh, parent teacher conference for including ears on her self drawing. So, she's one of the only <laughs> kids that included ears. Yeah, nice. That's kind of a big deal. <laughs> Humble brag. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, and I think if you if you're building stuff uh, in woodworking and you don't you don't take something new away from every project that you do, I don't think you're pushing yourself enough. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I think you should pick up something from everything you do, whether it's, you know, you're on the lathe and you're like, oh, hey, look, that was a super clean cut. What did I do with that gave me that really clean cut? Or you look at, you know, you look at something, you're like, oh, hey, that shape freaking sucks. Let's not do that again. You know, <laughs> like whatever, whatever it is, I think you should always take something away from what you're doing. Um, you know, will you remember it the next time you do it? Probably not until you say, yeah. oh, crap, I did it again. But Yeah. Yeah, each project is a snapshot in time of kind of where you were and what you're learning. And so it makes me wonder, this uh, cabinet I've been working on for 13 years, like, is it like little snapshots all put together? And this is like a scrapbook of yes, of <laughs> yeah. little I have projects over time. Working for. Yeah. Yeah, I have a dresser, our bedroom dresser is one that I started right when we found out that we were gonna have our first child and I did not finish it until seven years later. Mm -hmm. And more or less, it was just kind of sitting in storage or taking up space in my shop where it shouldn't have been. And when I finally got back to the point where I wanted to finish it, A, it didn't really take that long to finish and B, uh, I was appalled at whoever had started that project because <laughs> they yeah. were not the woodworker that I am now right? Yeah. or was at that time, you know? So it's just kind of interesting to be able to, to go back and be like, wow, I did that. That was an odd choice. I'm not yeah. sure I would do that again. Yeah. Yeah. It, I, it seems like too, that I'll find projects that I did maybe, you know, 10 years ago or, or more. And it's just like, what was that person thinking when they did yeah. this? And, so yeah, I, I just helped process. my parents move into their new house this last weekend. And I moved a couple of the projects that I had built in high school. And I'm like, Oh, like, let's just put this one in the basement. <laughs> we'll stack some boxes <laughs> on it. Yeah. That would be great. <laughs> Don't let anybody know that was me. <laughs> yep. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Long, awkward pauses means that at the end of another episode of the shop notes podcast, Thanks for listening. If you have any questions, comments, or smart remarks about today's episode, we would love to hear it. 
We have all of our podcasts available on our YouTube channel, and you can leave comments there. We try and address most of those as they come through. You can also email us, woodsmith at woodsmith.com, for anything that you want to see or hear more about. Uh, don't forget to check out our show notes page, woodsmith.com slash podcast, to see some of the examples of things that we've been talking about. Once again, we want to thank Shaper Tools for sponsoring today's broadcast. Uh, if you want to find out more about the Shaper Origin, their handheld CNC option, take a look at shapertools.com and learn about their risk-free 30-day trial. Thanks again, and we'll see you next week for the Shop Notes podcast.